Without further ado, our keynote will focus on the future of manufacturing and will be presented by Toyota Motor Manufacturing Canada's General Manager, Robert Ruggieri. A little about Bob. Having started in the manufacturing engineering role, he now has 25 years of experience at TMMC. He was a key leader for the introduction of the first Lexus product to be built outside of Japan, which was the RX 330 in 2004 and the opening of Ontario's newest auto plant, which is TMMC's West Plant in Woodstock, Ontario in 2008. He is currently responsible for all aspects of manufacturing at the Toyota RAV4 and RAV4 hybrid vehicles at TMMC's West Plant. He considers himself a car guy and loves everything about vehicles. He is a Southern Ontario native with a degree in mechanical engineering from McMaster University. He lives in Cambridge with his wife and four children. After Bob has finished his presentation, we will open the virtual floor for any questions. If you have any questions during or after the presentation, please post them in the Zoom Q&A box below. Over to you, Bob. Thanks, Mario. I really appreciate the opportunity to be part of this event. You know, it's really an exciting time to be working in manufacturing and more specifically in the automotive industry. Our products are changing so rapidly as we continue the transition to smart, connected, autonomous, and of course, electrified vehicles. And in parallel, the way we manufacture these products is also changing as we move towards Industry 4.0, the Internet of Things, and of course, a strong push for carbon neutrality. As Mario mentioned, I work for Toyota Motor Manufacturing Canada, or TMMC. For those of you who don't know us that well, I'll take a quick moment to outline our manufacturing operations here in Ontario. Team MC started producing Corollas back in 1988 in an annual volume of just 50,000 units. We grew quite quickly and attracted a series of investments, including one making us the first plant outside of Japan to be awarded Lexus production back in 2003. In 2008, we also added a plant in Woodstock, Ontario, and it's still the most recent greenfield automotive plant in Canada. Today, we make over 500,000 cars a year. That's 10 times our original volume. Our Cambridge site has two lines, one that produces the Lexus RX and one that currently produces the RAV4, but we'll add the Lexus NX early next year. And our Woodstock site produces the RAV4, RAV4 exclusively. We are very fortunate to be producing the top selling Lexus model and the top selling Toyota model in our lineup. We are now the largest automotive operation in Canada by volume, the largest Toyota operation in the Americas and one of the largest in the world. While our history has been one of sustained growth and prosperity, that hasn't always been the case from a broader perspective. Over the past two decades, we've seen a net reduction in automotive production in Ontario, as some of our competitors' plants have shut down or downsized, with that production moving to Mexico or the southern U.S., seemingly attracted to lower labor and operating costs. There's no getting around the fact that Ontario is a relatively expensive place to manufacture things, as our input costs are typically higher than in competing jurisdictions. That doesn't mean that we can't be competitive. Over our 33 year history, TMMC has continued to invest in our operations and our production and employment have continued to increase over time. We have a proud history filled with incredible accomplishments, awards and sustained growth. And we plan to maintain and build on that success. I'd like to walk you through our high level vision for doing that during an unparalleled time of change in the industry. In order to do that, I'd like to take a moment and explain our cost structure. The average transaction price of a car in Canada last year was around $40,000. Roughly 80% of the cost of a vehicle is parts and components, and these don't really change based on where you make the car. Of the remaining 20%, we'll call this manufacturing controllable cost, about 40% or 8% of the total is labor, by far the largest contributor. Not to simplify things too much, but the best way to minimize labor costs are one, maximize its value output. What I mean by that is to eliminate non-value added work or let the machines do this work as much as possible. Non-value added work includes things like inspection, repair, or conveyance of parts inside the plant, or actually anything that doesn't add value directly to the finished product. The second way, and again, not to state the obvious, is to have a very high production uptime. As technology continues to advance, we have more and more tools in the toolbox to optimize these two aspects to the highest levels. I'll spend the rest of my presentation discussing some of them. Today, we are operating in an environment where we have incredible
incredible low cost but highly capable hardware and software solutions at our fingertips. Just one example. This is my iPhone 12. It has an accelerometer, a gyroscope, a barometer, a GPS, a proximity sensor, an ambient light sensor, a digital compass, a LiDAR sensor, and of course an incredible camera. It's such an incredibly powerful tool available at such a relatively low cost, it can almost be considered disposable hardware. When you pair this type of capability with the latest software, including machine learning, you can deploy very sophisticated tools across your operations quickly and cost effectively. Now, I'm not suggesting you control your equipment with an iPhone, but there are many low cost, highly capable hardware and software solutions that can allow you to take an iterative approach or develop that breakthrough innovation for your operations. The power of apps is also finding its way into shop floor daily operations. Perhaps the most common use right now is the acquisition of inputs from the factory floor that were typically done with pen and paper and then subsequently in entered into a database. This gives us improved accuracy and real-time trending, analysis and alerts, and also helps us to enforce standardized work. Some other examples include equipment preventative maintenance, inspection and defect management, pre-shift startup checks, and product audits, just to name a few. The key is how do you capture, process, and visualize information quickly so you can act on it? I think manufacturing apps are just in the infancy stage and are set to have a dramatic effect on daily operations and management. Another area that continues to develop at a fast pace is wearables. One use case of wearables at our plant is paint inspection and repair. An inspection team member wears a mobile device on their wrist where they input any paint imperfections. Further down the line, <clears throat> a repair operator has a similar device on their wrist that indicates the type of defect and location. This allows for more streamlined and accurate data, makes the process less error prone, and also provides improved traceability. We have also begun to introduce augmented reality into our facilities to enhance new team member training. We recently worked with Microsoft to develop an AR training program using their HoloLens hardware that allows newly hired team members to step through the assembly process many times with real-time feedback and without the need for constant supervision. We are just in the pilot phase, but we have seen approximately a 40% reduction in defects from new hires using this technique. The next generation Lexus NX and RX that we will be launching next year will also employ this tool, all before a prototype vehicle is ever produced. When it comes to the future of manufacturing, I couldn't get away without discussing collaborative robots. They're nothing new and we've been using them for years, but they're now cheaper and smarter than ever. In fact, they're expected to be 30% of all robot sales by 2027. Traditionally, we've deployed them alongside our production team members. The cobots would focus on repetitive, non-value-added work, allowing our team members to focus on the high-skilled or knack work. But now, robots coupled with advanced vision systems and deep learning artificial intelligence are becoming capable of performing more advanced, high-knack, value-added work. They can adapt to physical variations and adjust their parameters in real time. We're already seeing off-the-shelf pre-canned peripherals that don't require specialized skill to integrate, such as hand grippers for packaging or paint spray guns. With these low-cost solutions, you can take an iterative approach to automation without a large capital investment. The image you see on the right there is from our plant in Woodstock, where we've been able to use a robot to install grommets. It doesn't sound complicated, but when you need very high knack specific finger movement, it was quite a challenge to get this to work flawlessly. One of the areas that I think has the most low hanging fruit is the automation of internal logistics. We have worked with local partners to deploy a variety of solutions ranging from small scale units delivering an individual part like an instrument panel to large scale autonomous tow motors that can deliver dozens of sequence parts across our shops or between different areas of our production facilities. They're safer, mission-based, with smart traffic control preventing congestion. They're also flexible, self-correcting, and use machine learning to optimize their performance over time. As I mentioned earlier, another focus area of non-value-added work is inspection. Inspection creates no value for the end customer, but it is a necessary evil in most cases. The capability of today's vision systems can effectively automate not only basic inspection, but more and more items that traditionally have required human eyes. For example, painted surface inspection. We're also leveraging vision technology upstream in the manufacturing process ahead of final inspection to avoid costly and invasive repairs. 
an example from my world is automated inspection of basically the guts of the instrument panel before it's installed to the vehicle. The latest vision system technology coupled with machine learning can detect defects that are otherwise very difficult or very expensive to detect. As an example, we recently partnered with IBM and Apple to develop a deep learning vision system using an iPhone. It's mounted above the assembly line and can inspect for partially locked electrical connectors. In a vehicle, a partially locked electrical connector is almost impossible to detect visually, but has a huge impact on the customer if it comes apart later in the field. This tool and tools like it will be able to effectively eliminate this type of defect in the future. Advanced vision with machine learning can also be used to track the movement of people or objects and confirm against a learned standard to make sure something is not a process. And finally, there are also use cases that extend beyond identifying abnormalities, such as automating calls for parts or eliminating the need for part codes. Another area where machine learning can be leveraged is for predictive maintenance. Now, predictive maintenance isn't anything new, but typically it's based on sensors or inputs that need to be programmed or configured to detect an impending failure. With machine learning, it has the ability to identify the abnormal without defining what the normal state is. It can distinguish between, quote, normal abnormalities and real abnormalities. Ultimately, machines will be making decisions not based on code, like if A then B, but based on many smart, connected wireless sensors and inputs combined with learned algorithms. We're really just scratching the surface in terms of what these systems are capable of. I realize at this point, it might seem like I'm predicting that machines will take over from humans. That's really not the case at all. Automation isn't new for us. We've been automating processes for a long time. And at the same time, our employment has actually continued to grow. As we've become more and more efficient over time, we've been awarded more business, which has resulted in increased employment. So automation does not mean fewer people. Efficiency means being more competitive. And being more competitive makes us more attractive for investment. Our people are our greatest strength. We don't think that will change, but we do see some changes on the horizon. We'll talk about those next. At TMMC, we have a highly skilled workforce. Not only our engineers and tradespeople, but a production workforce that's highly educated when compared to other Toyota plants around the world. That's a function of where we live and work, southwestern Ontario. We have world-class post-secondary institutions, a vibrant and expanding tech community, and a highly motivated and engaged workforce. But this move towards increased automation and innovation has created a new class of worker, and our education systems and internal training systems need to adapt to this worker of the future. Traditionally, we have had four branches of labor, IT, engineering, skilled trades, and production team members. Today, there's a fifth branch of skill that sits between production team member and skilled trades, a mid-skill technician, if you will, who can maintain, modify, configure, or troubleshoot today's simple automation. While skilled trades, which we classify as our maintenance team, still install and maintain equipment as well as handle complex repairs, many of our problems are quick fixes where someone can jump in and quickly fix something with little to no safety risk. Now, our administration and engineering teams will also see some changes going forward. Today, we're seeing a convergence of our IT and OT, or engineering departments, where IT is taking on more of a shop floor role, while engineering takes on more IT functionality. This is being driven by the industrial internet of things and greater reliance on software. The last item I wanted to touch on with regards to human resources is virtual work and just some personal reflection. During the past year and a half dealing with the global pandemic, COVID restrictions forced us to rethink the way we do some things, driving technological and social systems for remote work and virtual collaboration. I mentioned earlier, we'll be launching a new vehicle next year, the Lexus NX. And by this point in the project, we would normally have had hundreds of individual trips to Japan to work on the vehicle and manufacturing development. Obviously we couldn't do that, but the work still had to happen. So we worked with our teams in Japan to migrate to virtual collaborative platforms. In many ways, it was actually more effective than being in person since the camera could go places that most observers couldn't. It's been successful so far and we've certainly learned a lot going through it. And many of our team members want to sustain some of these systems even once COVID restrictions have been lifted. However, it wasn't all good. On the left side of the screen, you can see some of the obvious advantages of remote work. But there are limitations and some drawbacks. Opportunities for networking and camaraderie suffer. 
Managing by going around becomes difficult. But the largest impact is the ability to go to the shop floor and see issues with your own eyes. The Japanese term for this is Genshi Gimbutsu. And as they say, extremes are dangerous, and I would recommend a balanced approach when considering virtual work in the future. But what does the future look like? Imagine a near future with billions of people, all with smart devices, all connected to each other and practically everything, where we have instant access to information and continued breakthroughs in artificial intelligence and machine learning. Now combine this with the evolving geopolitical factors, a focus on carbon neutrality, dynamic trade environment, and you get limitless possibilities at a high rate of change. You've probably heard about manufacturing agility, but what will become even more important to survive is manufacturing adaptability. This is analogous to Darwin's survival of the fittest. It's an inherent ability to quickly and purposely adapt to unexpected changes. In order to go from agile to adaptable, we see five key areas of focus. Advanced analytics and visualization, flexible and agnostic hardware, infrastructure, having a formal innovation strategy, and lastly, people development. Now, this decision should always be data-driven, but with today's powerful software providing advanced analytics, these decisions can be influenced by even more insights. This software can expose trends or relationships between variables that are otherwise hidden and surface problems before they happen. Better visualization of your performance allows you to understand your strengths and weaknesses, adapt quickly, and react in an instant. The graphic on the right there is a very good depiction contrasting or explaining the difference between business intelligence and business analytics. Flexible and agnostic hardware. Within the context of the automotive industry, this means less fixed conveyors, more AGVs, more AMRs, autonomous mobile robots, more cobots, uh, more floor mounted equipment as it's less expensive and easier to move. And cordless tooling, wireless sensors. These flexible systems allow you to shift quickly and adapt to a dynamic environment with minimal cost. Agnostic hardware means not being locked into a particular vendor's proprietary software. This is typically more costly and requires a much longer lead time to make any necessary changes. Investing in wireless infrastructure is often difficult to justify quantitatively with a return on investment. But as we move towards Industry 4.0, it will become mission critical. 5G and Wi-Fi 6 networks are going to be necessary to move the massive amounts of data that will fuel the industrial Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, and advanced analytics. More IoT devices and more data also means a requirement for more bandwidth. More high-definition cameras and advanced vision systems are going to push us even further. Having all of these smart devices without the infrastructure to support them is analogous to driving a Lexus RC in downtown Toronto traffic. As we move into a digitized space, we will be more at risk for cyber-related crimes, so we need to have an eye on cybersecurity. The type of data we'll be managing is highly proprietary and highly confidential. Protecting that data at all times will be an absolute priority. No matter the size of your operation, it's important to be purposely innovative. Some large operations have innovation departments, personnel whose sole purpose is to seek out and implement innovation across their facilities. Regardless of your resources, a formal documented innovation strategy will serve to establish guiding principles and allowable trade-offs. Collaboration with non-traditional partners is another tactic to be able to navigate and adapt to rapidly changing conditions. For us operating in the Waterloo region, we are absolutely surrounded by tech companies, both startup and well-established, who all have high capabilities and near constant supply of breakthrough technologies. We've already worked with a variety of firms that have helped us supply, develop, and integrate technical solutions to historical and new challenges. And finally, we have people development. I mentioned earlier that our people are our greatest strength, our greatest assets, and they need continuous investment and nurturing. We are fortunate to be surrounded by several technical colleges and universities, and we have found that investing and collaborating with them can be a win-win scenario. When it comes to developing leadership, we know the workforce is changing. Today's graduates are highly skilled and better educated than ever, but they also think differently and can't be managed the same way as when I first came into the workforce. They need purpose, to believe in what they're doing. They need to, quote, buy in. There's also increased competition for that talent. 
Graduates have many more options than they did 20 years ago. But the most important skill set we need to teach and nurture is strategic thinking. We need our leaders to be tuned into market trends, impending changes, and potential disruptions. Things are more dynamic, so there's greater risk, but also greater opportunity. We need our current and future leaders to embrace this dynamic and position us for future success. So as I wrap up, I hope I've been able to paint a picture of what the future of manufacturing may hold. In summary, the complexity and capability of products and manufacturing technology are changing so quickly that only the innovative, agile, and adaptable companies who embrace tomorrow's technology will survive. Thanks again for allowing me to be part of this event, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them now. Thank you very much, Bob. Lots of great information. On a personal note, before COVID, I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to visit both TMMC plants in Cambridge and Woodstock, and was very impressed with both of them. Uh, we will now move on. <laughs> we will now move on to a question and answer part of the keynote. If anyone has any questions for Bob, don't forget to post them in the Zoom Q and A tab. Uh, a few questions have come in during the presentation. Are you working directly with your sub-tier suppliers to assist them in successfully adopting some of these advanced technologies in their operations? And does TMMC have standard workaround technologies, transition, and flow down? Um, first, I think I could argue that Toyota in general has a special relationship with their, with their suppliers, especially their, their tier one suppliers. And we generally treat them as part of the family. So if we can level them up, make them stronger, then it makes, makes us stronger as well. Um, some other OEMs, it's, it's very much a business relationship, you know, supply this or, or else. Um, when it comes to supporting them, typically we support them at the fundamental level. So at the basic TPS level. Um, when it comes to innovations, again, because all of this is so new, we're working on our own standardized work uh, and how to, yeah, how to expand these technologies to our other, um, other plants across North America. So we have uh, nine main assembly plants in uh, the US, Canada, and Mexico. And we have systems with which to share amongst the plants. Um, again, at, at the supplier level, typically it's, it's more the fundamental type of uh, basic production management systems. Another question, with the skilled labor shortage, are you supporting and financing any trade schools and students? Uh, we do have a direct um, uh, relationship with Conestoga College, which is uh, just down the road from our, our Woodstock plant. And we do have a, an apprenticeship program um, with them as well. That's, that's basically our, the extent of our, our involvement. Okay, uh, another question. Regarding automation and skilled employee influence, do you have any development plan or topic to argue and enforce this technology in the industry? I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, if it's regarding that mid-skill uh, type position that, that I spoke about in terms of, you know, not skilled trades, not engineers, but more the uh, sort of the, the technician type of role to support this type of automation. Um, up till this point, we've pretty much um, have, have bred those positions internally. I mentioned that our, our production workforce is, is quite highly skilled, um, uh, being or working in the area that, that we are. And with close to 9,000 employees, we have uh, quite a large uh, pool of resources to pull from. So even though these are you know assembly line workers, a lot of them have quite high skills. We're able to uh, recruit those positions internally. We are in some preliminary discussions, again, with Conestoga College, uh, potentially to, uh, to make some more formal programs for this mid-skill um, type of role over the next few years. Okay, another question came in. Uh, can you give examples or elaborate on the scope of advanced vision capabilities in production? Is it mostly related to defect control or process control? Based on the number of installations, I would say uh, inspection or defect control. Uh, we do have, I, you know, I mentioned that, that iPhone um, uh, example, that's kind of a proof of concept, but we do have uh, four installations um, across the two plants. And really we're using those for um, cases where we need something quick. You know, there's some issue that we need to contain. 
and you know it, we can basically uh, you know install and get it operational literally within a day. Uh, otherwise, if they're more permanent type installations, we'll you know we'll use uh, you know Cognex VD uh, type of technology, which also has uh, machine learning capability. Um, we also use um, vision for basic wrong and missing. So is the right part installed or is the right or is the part installed at all as well? Uh, for process control uh, vision, the one example I mentioned about the grommet installation. So the, the robot uh, uses vision to position itself and adjust um, vehicle over vehicle as there are variations in the vehicles and in, in the, uh, the conveyor and the pallets that they, they do sit on. Um, also, we do have some automated uh, tightening that also uses vision again to adjust the, uh, the robot parameters. Okay, another question. How are you incorporating AI in the process? And can you give us an example? So, and the extent of AI right now is, um, again, these inspection vision systems that I mentioned. Uh, we basically, we go through a, uh, a learning or the software goes through a learning process where we teach it what, what is the good. Actually, it, it learns what is the good and it will uh, identify anything that is different from what it's seeing. And then we'll basically say, yes, that is a problem or no, it's not a problem. And it will get better over time. Um, our uh, automated paint surface inspection, same type of idea, it will detect the abnormal. We will basically uh, instruct it whether that abnormal is okay or not. And then over time, it learns um, what that abnormal is. So again, primarily right now, AI is in inspection and then also some of our uh, uh, AMR type applications for automated uh, delivery. It will uh, optimize its route based on um, learned uh, congestion paths and that type of thing. Okay, another one that's come in. When you look at the challenges organizations have in successfully accomplishing a digital transformation. Could you comment on the relative impact of leadership versus technical capabilities on the success of the implementation? I would say leadership is probably three quarters of it. Um, if, if the leadership doesn't uh, promote an atmosphere of, of Kaizen or of innovation and doesn't allow its innovators to you know, go out and see the world, to try things, make mistakes, um, it, it won't happen. So, uh, you know, within the Toyota North America world, it's been made a priority at the highest levels. And, um, you know, at, at certain company events, you know, each plant has to present their innovation. So there's uh, absolutely a drive for it. Um, if, you know, if, if the, the leadership is, you know, basically has the blinders on and they're looking at daily operations, did you make your number yes or no? Yeah, you won't make any progress. So absolutely critical. Okay. What skills do you look for in engineering graduates? Hmm. Interesting. Um, I would I'll, I'll sort of related to the, the last question there. Um, we very much uh, will prioritize more on the, the soft skills, the ability to interact with others, teamwork, collaboration, um, and then the, the technical skills are often secondary because, you know, in, in, in university, you learn first principles, you know, you, you don't learn, you know, day-to-day -day manufacturing, um, technology, that's all things that can be learned. If you have someone with, uh, with drive and with the, uh, the social skills to operate as a team, it's very rarely anymore, you know, is there the, uh, you know, the, the single star, right? Typically it's teams that produce the, uh, the innovations now. Okay, what do you find to be the biggest causes of quality control issues in your supply chain? Supply chain, well, it'd be nice if we could get some micro trips out of uh, <laughs> East Asia there. Uh, quality issues from supply chain, um, Obviously, the uh, COVID in the last couple of years and the associated um, 
turnover or available availability of uh, labor. Um, we've also struggled a little bit with that, with with high absenteeism and turnover. So you're, you're training a lot of new people, and um, if if the suppliers don't have the strong uh, management systems and they rely on tribal knowledge, then the new people um, often will make mistakes and, and things will will blow out. Uh, very rarely is it due to uh, you know equipment breakdowns or, or that type of thing, um, but. Oftentimes, um, it is based on human error and uh, relying on that tribal knowledge and, uh, and the employee turnover, I would have to say. What is your biggest challenge in developing your Industry 4.0 solution? Biggest challenge, and I mentioned it towards the end there, is having that formal innovation strategy is... is uh, documenting what you're trying to achieve. So it's, it's not about, you know, we need, uh, you know, these particular pieces of technology um, just because they're industry 4.0, you know, we need to have these sensors uh, uh, online and, and uh, track this data and, and get it up into a database because that's what industry 4.0 says uh, to do. You have to tie it to what you're trying to achieve. So, you know, in our case, I mentioned uh, at the beginning there that Ontario is, is a relatively high cost environment. So, you know, one of our, um, not our only priority, but one of our, our biggest priorities is uh, maintaining our competitiveness and becoming more and more competitive. So when you define what that means for you, you know, in our case, labor is our largest controllable cost. So we're trying to achieve lower labor costs. Therefore, we will automate conveyance therefore we will automate inspection um, you know just putting in something for the sake of it and, and not defining why you're doing it or having a, a return on investment it doesn't have to be immediate return on investment it could be a strategic investment like your uh, wireless infrastructure that i mentioned if increasing automation is demanding tight manufacturing tolerances of conventional parts do you think Future robotics will tolerate less demanding geometrical perfection. Absolutely. Um, we, we generally try to stay away from demanding uh, high tolerances. And, uh, you know, our, our design teams, and again, that, that's not my, my core business, right? I just put them together. Uh, but our vehicles are designed such that they generally don't demand such precision. You know, unless you're, you're talking about powertrain type of, of components. Um, with equipment or with, again, uh, advanced robotics and um, machine vision, they're more and more able to uh, adapt to, to uh, irregularities. So I, I think actually as we go forward, the requirement for tight tolerances will decrease because the equipment can, can accommodate, can uh, adapt to it. As a large company with many moving pieces, how have you maintained effective communication with vendors and worked to solve problems that typically would require site visits between vendors and manufacturing staff? Uh, if, if that's referring to COVID, um, basically twofold. Uh, one is using the virtual tools that um, I think everyone is becoming familiar with, with now. So an example as of, of today i was doing a, a review of a new amr a new uh, autonomous mobile robot um, and it's currently being um, uh, produced in poland and we just did uh, my team did uh, a buy off of, of the prototype equipment in poland but they did it virtually um, and there's very little that you you can't do virtually other than uh, some of the, the challenges that i mentioned in terms of communication, et cetera. Uh, the other way, or the other main tactic for us, and again, that's uh, maybe we have the advantage is because we have um, nine main assembly plants, we also have unit plants across the country. Uh, we've been relying on each other. So if our plant in Kentucky, for example, is doing business with a Canadian uh, supplier in this location, we will um, be that liaison and vice versa. If we're doing business with an American uh, company, um, in Texas, for example, our Texas plant has been our liaison for us. So we, we uh, lean on each other to, to keep that relationship going. Okay. 
Now, a number of OEMs in Canada have made announcements in the past year related to future investments in electric vehicle production. Does Toyota have any similar plans? As I mentioned, I've been with the company 25 years, and I don't think a single year has gone by without a significant uh, investment or announcement of, of, of an investment. Um, I, I mentioned next year we're launching a uh, new NX or taking that on that product as well as new arcs. Both of them involve uh, electrification. Um, and, you know, they, I'm sure everyone's heard, but the uh, current U.S. administration is targeting 50% uh, battery electric or plug-in hybrid vehicles by 2030. So we'd be, we'd be foolish not to have ourselves uh, positioned to take on, on those products. Now, from your presentation, are you really using an iPhone on the assembly line to inspect vehicles? Absolutely, yeah. I mentioned we have uh, uh, four, four installations right now. Again, they're, they're meant to be you know, quick, uh, flexible systems, or you know, they, they won't be there for, for years on end. Um, we also, uh, we use iPads for our, our, our maintenance team members, we use iPads for their PMs. Um, our plant actually in, uh, in Indiana is piloting uh, Apple Watch for their team leaders. So when uh, you know, if there's an issue on the production line that team leader needs to be called, they, they get the call through their uh, Apple Watch and they have uh, you know, visualization and analytics around it. So absolutely. I mentioned um, uh, you know, the, 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 the raw computing power of uh, the so software and hardware that you can get in consumer electronics. Why not leverage it? Okay. Are you having difficulty recruiting the mid skill positions that we you spoke of? No, um, as I mentioned, uh, given our workforce, our, our, you know, the sheer size of our workforce and the, the uh, talent pool there, we've been able to uh, fill those positions uh, internally. And um, although we don't have formal training programs for them, they work with our vendors as we're integrating the new technology and they slowly become experts in their field. So at this point in time, um, no, there's no, has been no concern, but keep in mind, these are very small teams. You know, if you have to, you know, hire a, a technician for every AGV you install, then, then you, know, you haven't gained anything. So um, really, you know, in, in the case of this plant, um, you know, we have hundreds of, of AGVs. We probably have maybe five dedicated uh, people that do that type of work. I'm talking about the, the, uh, this one Woodstock uh, plant here. No concern to this point. Now, not every company has the amount of resources that Toyota possesses. How does Toyota make decisions to make investments in any particular technology? And is there a particular cost slash benefit analysis that you go through? We do have deep pockets. Uh, the reason we have deep pockets is because uh, we have very, very tight cost controls. We have uh, very, very good uh, visualization of our, uh, of our costs. Um, you know, there reminds me of that commercial, um, not to be inappropriate here, but, uh, oh, you're using head and shoulders. I didn't know you had dancers. Well, I don't. So the reason why we have <laughs> deep pockets is because we, we, we manage our, our money uh, quite well. Um, but generally, uh, in our case, uh, we look for a, a two-year a return on investment. And um, we also do encourage uh, trying new new things if they're relatively low cost. So we're not going to spend millions of dollars on something that doesn't have a, a guaranteed return on investment. But we will um, invest, we will make strategic investments as well. So if, if every decision is based on, you know, what is the absolute lowest cost or high pro highest profit uh, option, uh, Eventually, you won't you won't uh, improve your operations. So, uh, to use the same example, investing in your wireless infrastructure, that there is no return on investment that you can that you can claim. You can make it up if, if you'd like, but ultimately, you have to to invest in, in those types of things. Or otherwise, um, you won't be able to improve yourselves. All right. Another question: Who is your AGV manufacturer, and how is their reliability? Uh, we use many. Um, 
we use uh, actually it's it's one of the Toyota Group companies, Toyota L and F, um, same uh, division of Toyota that produces forklifts, etc. Reliability is excellent. Um, we use uh, Auto, which is a local uh, actually. It was a startup. It's not such a startup now. It's, it's growing quite quickly in the Waterloo region. Um, they have the autonomous mobile robots. Again, reliability has been excellent. Uh, Mir, M-I-R, it's another company out of the U.S. that we use. Um, we haven't had a lot of uh, reliability issues with our EGVs um, in terms of, of hardware. Um, the struggles are often um, in terms of the configuration, traffic control, uh, that type of but in terms of mechanical breakdowns, uh, not so much. Um, another company we're working with, it's again out of Poland, is AIUT. A -I -U -T. Um, there's almost every month there seems to be a new, a new, uh, new company uh, that's getting into that business. Is there anything that you think we may have missed that you'd wanna, you want to add before we uh, end? Oh, um, it's, as I said, it's an exciting time. Uh, things are changing uh, so quickly. Don't be afraid to, to try new things and um, uh, you know, keep, keep, your, uh, keep relationships with your non-traditional partners. Um, you know, we have, a, a, in the Waterloo region here, there's, there's a, an organization called Catalyst Lab where they, they bring different, um, um, companies together to try and, and, and uh, develop new, new technologies. And at first, when um, it was suggested that we join this, this community, we thought, you know, what does that have to do with, with our, our daily manufacturing lives here at Delta? So we reluctantly joined, but actually it's been very fruitful. Um, you know, we've developed um, or sourced some significant breakthrough technologies for our operations here from you know, small startup companies or, or companies that we would never have considered doing business with. So uh, keep those ties or keep building those ties with uh, non-traditional partners and, and um, you'll be surprised uh, what you're able to achieve. But... Hey, thank you once again, Bob, for a very informative sessions and answering the great cross-section of questions that have come in from attendees. Thank you once again. Yeah, my pleasure. <laughs>